this morning. We welcome Shane Oliver. He's the head of investment strategy at AMP Capital Investors, where he helps to oversee more than $100 billion worth in assets. Uh, Shane, uh, we're still waiting for these uh, CPI, PPI numbers today to uh, check in on the latest inflation points in China. But uh, where do you think mm. we're heading here? Do you think we're seeing inflation becoming a risk for the Chinese economy? Well, there's no doubt it's a risk. The inflation rate has been hitting higher. I think these figures will confirm something like that, but not dramatically so. My feeling is there is further tightening to come in China, and there's probably more upside for the CPI, probably up towards 5% by the middle of the year. But by the same token, I think as Chinese money supply growth starts to slow down, as the pace of growth sort of comes off a little bit, and we settle down to 10% growth through this year, rather than continuing to spiral on higher, then I think that will cap inflationary pressures and these fears about um, runaway inflation will start to abate. So I don't see major concern in, in China. I think all they're really doing is tapping the brakes in a preemptive fashion, much as they did through 2004. Um, back then in 2004, it caused a bit of a correction in markets, but markets got over it and the trend resumed. Mm -hmm. But people aren't getting over the fact that China is tightening at this point. There seems to be a lot of jitters on the markets right now. What do you say to investors uh, that seem to be a bit cautious these days? Well, I can understand that. There's the China tightening. Of course, there's the issues in Europe and uncertainty in the US, given the potential bank re-regulation, all those sorts of things. So all of these things have come together at once, giving us this correction in markets. Asian markets so far have fallen, you know, give or take 12%. Um, mm -hmm. In the great scheme of things, there's nothing amazing about that. That's quite a normal correction. Back in April, May 2004, after an initial recovery coming out of the tech wreck in 2003, we did see about a 17% correction in Asian shares at the time. Yeah. But they then bottomed out once it became clear that China was not going to get aggressive. So, uh, you know, producer prices, consumer prices going in opposite directions here because the uh, producer price is coming in uh, way above economists' estimates, but uh, CPI seems yeah. to be a bit more contained. Well, most of the focus, of course, is on the CPI, and I'd have to say that is good news. Um, there was, I think, a bit of a push up in prices in December on the back of bad weather, and it was mainly food related, and it seems that some of that impetus has come out. Um, it's also worth noting, and we haven't yet got the figures, but I think if you look at non-food inflation, it's probably down close towards zero. Um, as at December, it was just 0.2 per cent. So the picture in China, if you look at the trend, the trend is still up, inflation is still rising. The PPI tells us there's more increases in inflation ahead, but it's not getting out of hand. It's, uh, we're coming from a fairly low base, particularly if you allow for the if you strip out the surge in food prices. So, yes, I think the Chinese authorities are right to be tapping the brakes, but there's no need to get aggressive. And I think, as occurred in 2004, they will be successful in ensuring a soft landing in their economy, not the hard landing that investors seem to have um, started to assume more recently. Yeah, and Shane, when you say tapping on the brakes, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean interest rates are coming down the pipeline? Uh, someone said today maybe one interest rate hike at the end of this quarter. How do you see things... Uh I guess, how do you see the Chinese authorities tightening at this point? Well, I think we'll probably see another increase in the reserve ratio, maybe another 0.5% in a month or, or, or so's time. There'll probably be an increase in the, uh, the short-term lending rate, the one-year benchmark lending rate, maybe point... No, I mean, the Chinese tend to move in 0.27% increments, yeah. probably something of that order. But I guess the key point is that there's nothing aggressive likely to happen. We're not going to see ag an aggressive tightening in credit conditions. Um, I think the recovery will continue. What is really happening here is that the Chinese are trying to fine-tune the stimulus that was put into the economy to ensure that they don't have an inflation problem and they don't have surging property prices in some key cities. And I think basically they're doing the right thing. But the track record of the Chinese authorities over the last decade has been one of relative success. They have been quite successful in um, mm -hmm. managing their economy um, through tough times and through good times. And so and my, my feeling would be that they'll be achieved the same sex success this time. Okay, let me just bring up one more figure that we're getting across the ticker at this point. China's January new loans at 1.39 trillion yuan. So it looks like uh, China's uh, lending boom is still intact at this point, Shane. Let me just ask you about these credit conditions in China. Some are saying this is fueling the uh, asset bubble that we're seeing on the mainland. How do you feel? 
Well, those, those, those loan figures were well known, um, not the precise number, but there was talk that the loan figures were strong through the early part of January. And I think that's partly what motivated the authorities to try and slow down the pace of loan growth. And there was a lot of stories around about the authorities talking to individual banks and, and, and telling them to rein in their lending. So I don't think there's anything particularly new about those figures still remaining strong. I think the bottom line is that they will achieve the slowdown in lending growth that they're after through this year. Um, and ultimately that will help sort of take, you know, diffuse some of those concerns about a bubble. Do we have a bubble in China? I don't think we do. When you look at the PE mm -hmm. on the share market, um, the share market never got anywhere near its previous high and the PE is really just hovering around its long-term average. Um, if you look at historical earnings, I think it got up to about 30 times, which is pretty much in line with the long-term average on a forward basis. Um, it's actually well below that. Likewise, in the property markets, I know there's very strong property price growth in places like Beijing and Shanghai, but if you look at the nation as a whole, property price growth up until December was around 8% or thereabouts, which is hardly a boom. In Australia, okay. house prices over Shane? the last 12 months rose something like 13%. That's a yeah, you're talking about house prices. Let's talk about uh, those breaking figures coming from China. We have lots of numbers today for the Chinese economy. And it looks like uh, property prices uh, across uh, China for the month of January gained 9.5%, which is slightly higher than the 8% average growth you were just talking about. Is that a point of concern? Well, not really. 9.5% is not that high. The Chinese economy grew 10.7% through the, the year last year. If you add on a bit of inflation, that's about 13%. So property prices are growing more slowly than the growth in national income, than the growth in national output. Um, that's a rather unusual circumstance. If you go to Western countries like Australia or the US, when the US was going through the boom, property prices were growing well in excess of national GDP and well in excess of household incomes, likewise in Australia right now. So I think it's very hard to look at China and say that they've got a, 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 a massive property bubble. Yes, there might be in some cities, and it's appropriate to try and damp down price gains in places like Shanghai and Beijing. But overall, I can't see a property bubble in China. Okay, so Shane, uh, leave us with... simply not strong the... enough. Okay, well, leave us with this before the commercial break uh, on Chinese stocks. Uh, what are you doing with your positions right now in Chinese equities? Buying more, leaving off, or, or what are you looking at? Well, the Chinese, we, we have um, positions in Chinese A shares, which we don't change around that much because um, you can't take the money in and out of the country. And, and we're quite happy to hold those positions via our QFI, QFII license. Um, but in terms of um, Hong Kong, eight shares, you know, we actually think there's good opportunities there. That market has led on the way down here. It's had amongst the biggest falls across Asia mm -hmm. and that there's opportunities to increase the exposure there. So from a tactical point of view, in terms of our overall diversified fund, we, ha we have actually been buying into to Chinese eight shares.